The Rigel Black Chronicles, Book One, The Pure Blood Pretense. Chapter 17. Rigel stared out the window at the blurred countryside as the Hogwarts Express sped toward London. She tried not to fidget uncomfortably in the stiff robes Pansy had picked out for her. She doubted Archie had ever worn them, and she didn't blame him. The sleeves bellowed fashionably at the elbow, trailing when she walked at a judicious speed, but in her lap they felt heavy and hot, like a velvet curtain she was going to hem at any second. Millicent offered input on the strategy for introducing Rigel to the Lord and Lady Parkinson, and even though it was Pansy's parents in question, the blonde girl seemed genuinely appreciative of Millicent's insights. Lady Malfoy already likes Rigel, so lean on that if you have to, the dark-haired girl suggested. Her opinion will carry more weight than yours. Of course. Pansy shot Draco a smile. My parents will be hard-pressed to refuse a friendship with Rigel without calling the Malfoy's judgment into question. Perhaps, if it goes well today, I can approach my father about a formal friendship as well, Millicent offered. She had a tentative question in her eyes that said she half expected Rigel to refuse. Rigel found it utterly antiquated that pure-blood heiresses in dark society were held to stricter social conventions than the heirs, but she summoned a smile to reassure Millicent. Whatever makes you most comfortable, consider the door open on my end. They may as well get all necessary parental approvals out of the way before she outgrew Archie's dress robes. Millicent raised her eyebrows. You don't need to consult with your father first. He doesn't hold with such customs. At least, that's what Archie would say. Rigel thought her uncle had a more complicated relationship with his heritage than he or Archie admitted. Though Sirius insisted etiquette-based distinctions of class were irrelevant, and while he would never insist Archie uphold them, he'd still taught his son the old pure-blood customs. Better to have a tool and not need it, she supposed, than the other way around. Is that why... Millicent was interrupted by the sliding thwack of the door. Puppy! Before the first years could react, Fred darted into the compartment and lifted Rigel bodily from her seat. He pivoted like a dancer, heedless to the outraged gasps of her companions, and tossed her in one smooth movement to George, who caught her by the waist with only a moderately uncomfortable jolt. You'd make a decent trapeze artist, George set her down before him and dusted his hands with a player's flair. Did you see him tuck his legs, Gred? Fred grinned from Rigel's vacated seat between Draco and Blaze. His arms were stretched across the boy's headrests and the Slytherins seemed torn between violence and pretending the older Gryffindor did not exist. Be honest, pup, you've been chucked unexpectedly before. Rigel smoothed her robes before Pansy's glare could grow any stronger. I wasn't sure if I was going through the doorway or not. It only took cracking an ankle once to be inclined toward tucking extremities in such an instance, though it had been many years since her dad and uncle played hot potato with their children. She noted age had not improved the experience overmuch. Still, it was a marked improvement over the way the rest of Gryffindor House had been treating her. The Lions spent the end of term oscillating between refusing to believe one of their own had openly attacked a first year and going to great lengths to ensure the other houses knew Gryffindor didn't endorse such things. In both cases, they sidestepped Rigel in the corridors as though she was made of broken glass and they might accidentally slice open their honour if they got too close. Fred and George, naturally, overcompensated to the furthest degree in the other direction. One or the other picked her up, pulled her by the arm, pushed her along the corridor in front of them, or swung her in a circle at their every meeting. George leaned an elbow on her head, showing off his superior height and questionable dedication to underarm hygiene. Without breathing through her nose, Rigel reminded him, I did say goodbye before we left the platform. We missed you already. Fred pretended to dab his eyes, and Blaze produced a handkerchief to save his sleeve. 
Fred blew his nose in it and gave it back. We've decided to kidnap you and take you home to the burrow, George informed her. How do you feel about being stuffed in a trunk? Fred added hopefully. Rigel dislodged George's elbow for the sake of her neck. I suppose it would be difficult for you to survive the break without me if this is the result of a few hours' withdrawal. She was joking, mostly, and so were the twins, but there was a dark undercurrent they all skirted. When either thought she was distracted by the other, the bracing cheer fell away, and she had caught each of them staring at her from the bottom of a well of regret more than once. She bore their overbearing intrusion into her personal space with the understanding that they were as worried as her friends in Slytherin had been, and, unlike her housemates, didn't get to reassure themselves that she was okay whenever they needed to. If you came with us, Mum would feed you until you're too plump for those ridiculous dress robes, George offered. Rigel carefully did not look at Pansy as she lied, I like these robes. With a considering tilt of her head, she redirected. I suppose your brothers would be there too. Percy and I could get a lot of studying done if we had the whole break together. Fred stood from her seat with a forlorn sigh. And just like that, he's failed the first test. We'll have to try harder next term. George agreed with an apologetic grimace. You're not ready for the burrow yet. Perhaps one day... Fred put a hand to his heart and went down on one knee before her. Forgive us for failing you. Before she could respond, a loud gasp came from outside the open compartment door. Greengrass butted her way past George, her eyes wide. Are you proposing? Is it official? Does anyone else know? The twins froze, and Rigel sent a panicked look to the only person who could possibly save them. Pansy rose and took Greengrass by the hand. An unfortunate misunderstanding, she said quietly, leading the girl back into the corridor. Would you believe he forgot to apply to Rigel's head of house first? He didn't. Greengrass craned her neck to give Fred a scandalised look as Pansy ushered her out. Fred, to Rigel's horror, began to flush. There was a thick silence in the compartment as the flustered Gryffindor got to his feet. Then George's snort cut through it. Wait until I tell Mum! Fred lunged for his brother and Rigel barely sidestepped in time. The twins rolled into the corridor, George getting the worst of the tussle as he could scarcely stop laughing long enough to fight back. Can I be your best man? You won't survive to the rehearsal dinner. Pansy cleared her throat, and the twins remembered they had an audience. Scrambling to their feet, both third years bowed at the waist to the Slytherin girls. Our pardon, ladies, Fred said with an attempt at unaffected humour. George's grin promised no mercy. Our passions ran away with us. Fred groaned. Goodbye, Rigel, he called, hightailing it back to their compartment. George followed him cackling. Greengrass turned her disappointed moo on Rigel. So, you're not engaged? Pansy's eyes flashed over Greengrass's shoulder, telling Rigel that the girl's question was, unfortunately, in earnest. Rigel shook her head. A misunderstanding, as Pansy said. It seemed safest to let her socially gifted friend make the explanations, so she retreated into the compartment and waited for one of her other so-called friends to meet her eyes. Millicent put a hand over her mouth. Blaze didn't even bother hiding his slow grin. It was Theo who actually laughed. First proposal of the year. Congratulations, Rigel. She narrowed her eyes at the sandy-haired boy. Thanks a lot for the assist. One day... I'll return the favour. Theo raised his hands defensively. I'm not getting in the way of the first Gryffindor Slytherin union since who was the last? Pansy would know. Pansy came back into the compartment with a vaguely harried look. She shut the compartment door firmly behind her and said, Crisis averted. Thank you for not telling her it was a joke that can only reflect poorly on you at this stage in your social rise. Rigel didn't love the way Pansy said social rise, as though she had a seven-year plan with Rigel's name on it. Did she believe you? Draco asked. Didn't take much convincing, Pansy confirmed. 
No offence to your Weasleys, but their blood traitor status worked in our favour. Greengrass was only too happy to think he'd bungled the proper observances. Rigel winced. Is she going to spread unkind rumours about Fred? She believes him to be a tragic figure of forbidden interhouse infatuation. Rigel wondered if the windows opened. She could just hurl herself from the moving train, disappear into the forest, and never have to explain to Archie why he was the female lead in a modern-day Romeo and Juliet. And now she's gone to tell Davis, and they'll sigh over the dark romanticism of it all, Draco muttered. Girls are so insipid. Pansy angled her chin in a poised challenge, and Millicent's amused smile fell away. Draco was quick to capitulate. Not you two, obviously. Theo shrugged. They'll grow out of it, eventually. Merlin willing, before we're married off to one of them. Draco shuddered. Rigel tried to hide her distaste at the idea of arranged marriage, but she didn't quite manage it. Ah, but your father would look down on that sort of practice, wouldn't he? Blaze curled his lips in a mocking smile. Must be nice. No prepubescent betrothals for you to worry about. Dad's never mentioned it. Rigel spoke carefully, neither censure nor relief in her tone. But I doubt any of the families who still practice arranged marriage would accept one of the turncoat blacks as a prospect in any case. You might be surprised. Pansy gave a dark smile, and there was a bitter twist to her words that sharpened Rigel's attention. There aren't so many pure bloods left that one of the sacred 28 gets overlooked. Everyone's name comes up sooner or later. We're 11. Theo wrinkled his nose. Everything about us is going to change completely in the next few years. Everything but your last name, Millicent drawled. Her cynicism matched Pansy's note for note. Rigel thanked every god she knew by name that her cousin was a boy and she didn't have to navigate whatever tangled web made pure blood witches exchange the hundred yard stare of bloodied soldiers who had met in the trenches. A name can be tarnished unexpectedly, Draco said. Even he didn't look like he believed that, though. Yet family fortunes tend to trend upward regardless. Blaze swept his hands about the compartment in bleak commiseration. Face it, we're frightfully eligible and always will be. It's still mental to be thinking about it now, Theo insisted. Easy for you to say, Millicent grumbled. Draco wasn't convinced. You probably won't get a say anyway, he pointed out. Your parents will take the best offer and you'll go bravely to the stake. Pansy scowled and her fingers became delicate fists, but she didn't retort. What could she say? Draco, cruel as his words sounded, was perfectly correct. Pure-blood witches married for advantage because, unlike the wizards, the advantages they came into the world with meant nothing. Pansy would lose the Parkinson name and money when she married, so she had to marry a somebody or become a nobody in her social circles and every one of her peers faced the same choice and the same short list of options. Rigel tried to salvage the mood. I'll save you, she declared. A smile tugged ruefully at Pansy's lips. <laughs> you? Of course, I won't let you be married off to any of these duffers, Pan. The boys in the compartment gave squawks of offended honour, and Pansy's smile came into full bloom. If anyone tries and you don't like them, I'll intervene. My hero, Pansy affected an oxygenless tone that suggested she'd just run two flights of stairs. How will you save me? Demand a wizard's duel for my freedom? Battle my unscrupulous suitor's dragon-riding legions? Marry her yourself, Blaze's comment prompted a round of groans. I am already sworn to my potions, Rigel said regretfully. At Pansy's broken-hearted sigh, she shook her head with a smile. But at the slightest lift of your brow, I shall break my solemn vows and whisk you away to a bungalow in Bora Bora. An army of liberated house elves will feed you mangoes and shade your delicate skin from the Caribbean sun, so that every shade of palest pink I find in your ivory cheeks I can claim as my own. 
Pansy fought a wide smile as the others snickered. Is that all? Rigel could only rise to that challenge. Archie's reputation required it. With great pageantry, she painted a picture of their impossible future. That is only the days. When the moon lifts her veil, we will frolic like spring lambs in the surf, sipping on coconut nectar and crying our freedom to every wind that the gusts may carry news of our incandescent happiness to these hapless lemmings who shall be trapped in lonely longing behind the white picket bars of matrimony. Wasting away in sick envy, they shall weep when they hear the echoes of our joy on the western sea breeze. Their suffering will only gratify us, Pansy agreed, her blue eyes twinkling with mirth. For in our generous hearts we'll wish nothing more than for our friends to experience the same escape to complete freedom, even if death is the only door unlocked to them. Pansy's words proved too much. Stiff good breeding collapsed under the weight of sheer farce, and their housemates burst into laughter, long and uproarious. Rigel sat back in her seat, wholly satisfied. It was not the usual exchange of controlled snickers or the measured laughter of social calculation. Instead, the compartment rang with surprised delight, unself-conscious enjoyment, childhood, and Rigel wondered if any of them heard the difference before it died away. Sometimes I wonder if you were really raised by a bunch of pranksters, but then you say something like that. Theo dabbed at his streaming eyes with a handkerchief. Imagine keeping house elves in Bora Bora to shade you like some despoiled emperor. You're crazy, Rigel. All the blacks are crazy, Rigel said, but we do right by our friends. Which is when the Malfoys must step in to save their friends from a black's idea of saving. Draco shook his head, though his smile lingered. Pans, the minute this fool starts talking about French Polynesian islands, I will lock him up and send you my father's barrister. No marriage contract will stand a chance. Pansy laughed along with the others, but her eyes found Draco's steady gaze, and she nodded minutely. Rigel realised with a lump in her throat that Draco, unlike Rigel, was entirely serious in offering Pansy a way out. And Pansy, who knew that the possibility of having to draw on that aid one day was real, had accepted, silently grateful. Before their good mood could settle into boredom, the train pulled into the station. Pansy fussed with Rigel's hair and Draco's collar as they waited for the other students to depart. Pansy wanted a relatively empty platform for the meeting. They all had shrunken trunks, courtesy of Adrian Pusey in their pockets, so it was with the air of three people on a very important stroll that they finally disembarked the train. Your father isn't coming until later, Pansy clarified. Nerves straightened her shoulders and kept her chin higher than usual. Rigel hid her amusement. We have half an hour before he arrives. I told him I wanted to say goodbye to my friends without being embarrassed. A plausible fiction, Draco said. In truth, Rigel had asked Sirius for 45 extra minutes to give herself enough time to drink polyjuice after her friends and their parents had gone. Archie had arranged for the Potters to meet him at baggage claim so he could duck into a restroom and do the same thing. As long as his friends didn't know what his luggage looked like, they wouldn't think it odd when an unfamiliar girl picked it up. All they had to do was keep sipping polyjuice until they could exchange places and try not to lose count of the minutes since their last sip. There they are, Pansy nodded to four imposing figures standing well clear of the train smoke. The Malfoys were easily recognisable, resplendent in soft lavender silk, their hair so matched in colour that Rigel wondered if that had been the deciding characteristic when Mr Malfoy chose his wife. The Parkinsons were striking also, but not for their similarity. Mr. Parkinson was tall and lean, with jet black hair combed back from angular features and a sharp pair of glasses that glinted with spells from the right angle. Mrs. Parkinson was petite and energetic, with caramel curls bouncing about her shoulders and the dreamiest hazel eyes Rigel had ever seen. Rigel wasn't sure at first how Pansy could be related to either of them. 
The girl must have inherited her golden hair from a relative, or else one of her parents dyed theirs. "'Good day, Lord Malfoy, Narcissa,' Pansy said when they were within polite speaking range. "'Hello, father, mother.' Pansy's mother reached out a hand, which Pansy clasped and pressed gently. Both mother and daughter smiled with suppressed emotion, and Mr. Parkinson looked on with silent fondness. All Rigel could think was that she'd never witnessed a more restrained reunion. "'How are you, Miss Parkinson?' Malfoy Sr. asked. "'Very well, thank you.' Pansy stepped away from her parents. Mother, father, you remember Draco Malfoy? Draco stepped forward to shake hands with Mr. Parkinson and receive precisely one affectionate nod and two approving looks from the other adults. It was like watching a play set in the time of Merlin and Morgana, except none of the actors realised they were in a satire. Your son is a credit to you, Lucius, Mr. Parkinson said. His grandfather's bearing and your chin, I dare say but his mother's eyes. Mrs. Parkinson's own eyes fairly shone with vivacious cheer, perhaps to make up for the way the rest of her face stayed poised in a perfect pure-blood mask. Pansy came by her graces honestly, it seemed. So wonderful to see you again, Draco. The wonder is all mine, Draco bowed. Father, mother, may I introduce to you Rigel Black? Pansy placed a hand on Rigel's elbow. Rigel is our Slytherin yearmate, son of Lord Sirius Black and the late Lady Diana Black. Rigel bowed formally to Mr. Parkinson and his wife, hovering just above Mrs. Parkinson's hand as she did so. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Black, Mrs. Parkinson said warmly. How is your father? He is well, Lady Parkinson, and I dare say he will be even better when he learns of your kind query. Her tongue wanted to stumble over the use of lady, but she didn't let it. I am very glad for this chance to meet you both, and I would like to formally ask your permission to befriend your charming daughter. She directed the last bit at Mr. Parkinson, whose only reaction to Rigel invoking the old custom was a sheen of light obscuring his glasses as he tilted his head consideringly. What say you, Lucius? Parkinson turned to his friend. As you have the advantage of Mr. Black's acquaintance, I shall defer to your judgment. Malfoy gazed seriously into Rigel's blank face for a moment, then said, Although I have only had the pleasure of a brief meeting with young Mr. Black, he has the esteem of Severus Snape, a man whose opinion I trust implicitly, so I will vouch for his worth in regards to your daughter's friendship. Rigel bowed gratefully toward Draco's father, then lifted her chin and clasped her hands behind her back, ready to accept whatever decision Mr. Parkinson gave. With such a recommendation, I would be foolish to turn your candidature away, Mr. Black, he finally decided. May your friendship be long and mutually beneficial. Pansy beamed at her, and Rigel heard Draco let out a small breath of relief. Rigel nodded with the appropriate amount of dignity, but then Mrs. Parkinson let out a pleased sigh and stepped forward to embrace her. Marvellously done. The words were whispered in her ear, and Rigel felt very much like a child who had precociously performed a trick considered above her age bracket. Welcome to the fold, Mrs. Parkinson stepped back, her mask melted away by the warmth of her smile. Now that we are all friends, you must tell us about your first term. Narcissa accepted Rigel's bow over her hand with gracious nod. Did you have many adventures? Draco and Pansy exchanged a look, and Rigel tried not to twitch guiltily. Adventures? Pansy repeated, the picture of guileless puzzlement. Come, Draco. Malfoy raised his eyebrows expectantly. Your letters have been unusually vague of late. Pansies too, Mrs. Parkinson said, eyeing her daughter's neutral expression with dawning concern. Draco and Pansy both turned to Rigel. She had the sudden, uncomfortable realisation that for all her friends' warnings that they had a duty to report information to their parents, they had evidently not told them about what happened after Halloween. Perhaps not about Halloween, either. They'd protected her privacy instead. Well, it was too late to salvage that. 
Rigel wouldn't force them to lie to their parents' faces. She knew firsthand how difficult that could be. That's my fault, Rigel said. They were protecting me, though I did not ask them to. Mrs. Parkinson tried to smile. When the son of Sirius Black claims the blame for something, it must be quite a tale. Nothing so entertaining, Mrs. Parkinson, Rigel hedged. Just Rose, if you please. And do not leave us in suspense, Narcissa insisted. Your tone is ominous, Rigel, but surely we would have been informed if anything too terrible had occurred. If not by our children, then at the least by your headmaster. Malfoy's expression hardened. Even he would not keep news of a child's well-being from his family. Headmaster Dumbledore would not trouble you with news unrelated to your own son, Rigel said. The more exciting events of our final term have left Draco and Pansy completely unscathed. This I can assure you. And was your family equally assured of your own good health? Rose pressed. My father was kept abreast of all happenings, Rigel said. He will be honoured to know of your consideration. Her consideration was for you, Mr Black, not your father. Mr Parkinson spoke sharply. As Pansy's friend, your troubles will have ramifications in her life. And if you treat your own well-being so cavalierly... How can we expect you to take my daughter's safety and happiness into account? What happened wasn't Rigel's fault, Pansy protested. He's never put Pansy in danger, Draco agreed. Or me, he added when his mother narrowed her eyes. Cassius, Rose said in a low voice. They're children. No, my lady, he's right. Rigel inclined her head toward Mr. Parkinson. It is selfish to entertain the conceit that my troubles do not affect those around me. I would never want Pansy or Draco exposed by their friendship with me. And they would be if anyone knew the truth. The blood felt hot in her ears, and she looked at Pansy and Draco so quick to defend her with a sudden thick dread. What had she been thinking? It hadn't seemed so big a deal. Befriending them at school. They would see one another every day in any case. Why shouldn't she have somewhere to sit at meals and someone to talk to about classes? It would be harder... When it all ended in seven years, sure, but she had accepted that as a future difficulty, only standing there, looking their parents in the eye after all that happened at the end of first term. How could Rigel say she would do right by their friendship? Was that a promise it was even possible for her to keep? And did it matter? She had already made it, and she hadn't considered what it meant until too late. I'm certain this is much ado about nothing. Narcissa said kindly. What sort of political intrigues are you imagining occurred in a schoolyard, Cassius? One can never be too careful with one's children, Mr Parkinson said firmly, and if Mr Black has no qualms, I would rest easier knowing the full story behind my daughter's cryptic letters. I admit to some interest as well. Malfoy said, his expression giving nothing away. Severus has made infuriatingly offhand references to an event around Halloween that I cannot begin to guess at, and your name was thrown in amongst them, Mr. Black. Rigel glanced at her friends, both of whom nodded seriously. They would support her, however she framed the narrative. As a member of the Board of Governors, were you made aware of the circumstances surrounding Lee Jordan's withdrawal? Malfoy's face folded into a dark frown. It was closer to an unofficial expulsion. There hasn't been a student expelled from Hogwarts in 50 years, and the last time it happened, another student was killed. Mr. Parkinson's mouth pressed into a severe line. No one died, Pansy said quickly. What happened? Narcissa demanded. But it was her husband she looked to, not Rigel. Malfoy set his jaw. As a minor, his records are sealed, but I know he faces charges for attacking a fellow student. Rose looked to Rigel first. Was it you? That's the short of it. Rigel had practiced the clinical explanation of what happened, repeated it to herself until she could recite it without flinching, without shaking, 
Lee Jordan blames my father for putting his out of business. I'm afraid that enmity was transferred to me. Unfortunately, he took his dislike too far, and his actions caused enough harm that his continued presence in the school was considered unsafe. He never targeted Pansy or Draco, she added, and now that he's gone, the matter is satisfactorily resolved. Draco gave an indignant scoff. He nearly killed you. He attempted nothing of the kind. Because permanent disfigurement isn't cause for alarm, Pansy said sharply. I was talking about when you fell down three flights of stairs, Draco clarified. And maybe you've forgotten the acid on Halloween. Acid? Narcissa's hand flew to her husband's elbow, where he gripped it steadily. Events are beginning to square. Malfoy said, eyes glittering. Severus asked me to put an ear to the ground for any unreclaimed shipments of those joke tablets Jordan was written up for. The ones that didn't have the proper anti-amending charms on them. Parkinson phrased it as a question, but spoke as though he knew exactly what Malfoy meant. Rigel gaped at them. Did everyone else know about everything that happened to anyone in the magical world? How did they keep it all straight? Or did every old house have a team of current event analysts acting like the intelligence agency of a tiny nation? Did they share information? The knowing look Malfoy and Parkinson exchanged suggested some kind of standing trade agreement. Dangerous things, Parkinson said, heavy censure in his tone. I suppose Jordan's son managed to smuggle some into Hogwarts. Not only that, Pansy said, he used one to turn Rigel's pumpkin juice to acid. All four parents looked deadly in that moment. It could have been any of you, Parkinson said. What if Pansy or Draco had picked up the wrong cup? I think you'd best explain everything. There was a sigh in Rigel's chest that she kept carefully trapped there waiting for the moment she could never have to speak about Lee Jordan again. Perhaps Draco and Pansy can explain everything once you are comfortably at home, she suggested. It is a rather long story, but it's over now, and none of us are in any danger going forward. He will be tried! Parkinson cut sharp eyes to Malfoy. Malfoy looked less than pleased as he said, A plea deal, more likely. Unless Lord Black was to get involved, Rigel fought a shudder. No, we've left action to the DMLE. Lord Potter, then, Parkinson suggested. He's well positioned to... My family is not getting involved. Rigel had been as firm as possible in her letters home. The Auras had her statement, along with some circumstantial evidence from Halloween, but her magic had destroyed the weapon implicated in the final incident. They had Jordan's wand with Incarcerus and a number of other spells recorded on it at the time of her attack, but he had not fired any unforgivables, and he had not in the end hurt her very much. Serious charges might not hold water in court, and the Auras knew that. Rigel hoped Jordan did strike a plea deal, and the whole thing was resolved quietly and without her further involvement. The last thing Archie needed was to be interrogated over events he hadn't witnessed. We'd like to put this behind us. Both men eyed Rigel, as though they had a wealth of advice on the subject, but their wives had enough mercy to steer the conversation to less troubled waters. Let's turn to more pleasant matters, Rose said. I understand Draco made the Quidditch team this year. Indeed, Narcissa picked up the thread gracefully, and in his first year, quite an accomplishment. Only the reserve team... Draco said. His smile sat proudly on his cheeks, nonetheless. In a few years, I'll be Slytherin's starting seeker, though. Your father played himself when he was at school, didn't you, Lucius? Chaser, Malfoy agreed. It was the only way I could capture this lovely creature's attention. He smiled down at his wife, who blinked up at him as if to say it was no more than she deserved. What about you, Rigel? Rose asked. Did you try for the team? No, my lady. I prefer to focus my energies elsewhere. But you had a broken wrist this year, Draco pointed out. You're a good flyer. You should give it a go next year. You are an avid Quidditch fan, are you not, Mr. Black? 
Parkinson adjusted his glasses, and somehow it felt like a challenge. Unless you prefer to watch? Rigel tried to guess how Mr. Parkinson might have heard she was an avid Quidditch fan. It seemed an odd thing for Pansy to mention in Letters Home, as Rigel had been trying to dampen her interest in the sport all term, first to avoid flying with a broken wrist, and then to avoid this exact situation where someone might think it odd that Rigel didn't want to try out for the team. He must have heard that Air Black enjoyed Quidditch, in which case she knew exactly which pure blood could have passed that information on. "'Are you acquainted with the Flint family?' Rigel asked. "'Flint was at school with us,' Parkinson confirmed. For the first time he smiled, and Rigel wondered if she had finally impressed him by figuring out which connection had given her away. "'Rose and I happened upon him and his son at the Quidditch World Cup five years ago, and they mentioned you. "'Young Marcus Flint told us in no uncertain terms that he was saving the seat next to him for his friend Archie, even if he couldn't make it,' Rose smiled in reminiscence. "'Such a sweet boy!' Draco lifted his brows in patent disbelief, and Pansy had the look of someone tucking information into a red folder for later. Rigel remembered that year all too well. She and Archie were six, and her cousin had a ticket to one of the highest boxes in the stadium. Rigel had assumed Sirius bought it for him. She could even remember feeling a bit left out at the time, but now she wondered if the Flints hadn't had an extra seat and invited Archie to join them. The details blurred in irrelevance. Archie never got to go. That same week was the first time my mother fell ill. Rigel said as evenly as she could. I didn't end up attending the match, though Marcus is kind to have saved the seat anyway. The first time was frightening, but they'd thought it a fluke. The healers hadn't known how serious it was or even what it was. And then she got sick again, and again, an illness that defied diagnostics. By the time it became clear it was killing her, Diana had been in and out of the hospital dozens of times. She held on for over a year, but at eight, Archie had clung to his cousin's hand and watched, dry-eyed with hollow resignation, as his mother was lowered gently into the waiting earth. I suppose I didn't go to many Quidditch matches after that. It sounded silly to think of missed sporting events when Archie's whole life had slid out of shape that summer. Quidditch was only part of the normalcy that never recovered, though. When they learned Diana's illness was terminal, she'd watched her cousin swell into an almost manic vehicle for positivity overnight. In his mother's final months, he was the perfect son, doting, cheerful, optimistic, and never more than a room away. He lived like a songbird trying desperately to remain in the air. As long as he never landed, never brought down the mood or looked past the next morning, it was as though the world might exist in that bubble of light and laughter indefinitely. When the wind finally died beneath him, Archie hit the ground hard. She hadn't known how to catch him. The adults were gearing up to say something, something the real Archie wouldn't have wanted to hear, like how it was such an unfortunate tragedy or how Diana was somewhere better now, free of the pain, one with the wild magic of the world, or whatever people told themselves to pretend like the worst thing that could happen hadn't really happened. Rigel took the wheel of the conversation instead. Draco's tryouts were almost as good as a World Cup game, though. Remember Pansy? Pansy, bless her beautiful presence of mind, didn't even hesitate. How could I forget? Captain Flint unleashed four bludgers and three snitches simultaneously. I thought someone was going to be hurled to the ground for certain. My goodness! Rose's eyes finally shifted from Rigel's face, but they remained sad. Hogwarts Quidditch sounds more dangerous than it was in our day. Too dangerous, Narcissa agreed. It was fine, Mum, Draco said. Flint only did it to scare off the Gryffindors. Counterintelligence tactics. Now that's clever, Parkinson said. The conversation finally settled into something resembling normal parent-child exchanges. They spoke of classes, professors and schoolmates, and before she knew it, the clock had struck half-past. She only had fifteen minutes to meet Sirius in a cafe down the street from the station. 
It's been an honour making your acquaintance, Lord and Lady Parkinson, and a pleasure to see you again, Lord and Lady Malfoy. I'm afraid I have to excuse myself to go and meet my father. He isn't meeting you here, Rose asked, polite confusion in her tone. Narcissa frowned. Has he forgotten, Rigel? Sirius always did have a relaxed attitude towards schedules. No, I asked him to meet me later, to give us time to become acquainted. She wasn't going to let them think Sirius Black had forgotten his kid at King's Cross, though Rigel wasn't sure how much she revealed by admitting to arranging their meeting without his supervision. Then give him my best, Narcissa said carefully. Her eyes flicked between Rigel, Pansy and Draco, and Rigel couldn't begin to imagine what she was considering. I shall, though he does not deserve your best, fair lady. The adults chuckled, and Rigel felt good about the note they ended on as she hugged Draco and Pansy goodbye and wished them all a relaxing holiday. Past the magical barrier that concealed Platform 9 and 3 quarters, Rigel ducked into a public restroom and took one of their precious vials of polyjuice out of her pocket. She dropped in a strand of Archie's hair and had to grimace at the jarring shade of electric blue the addition produced. Archie would have such an alarmingly coloured essence. Trying to ignore the smell, Rigel knocked back the dose in one quick movement. A few years of this and I'll be able to take shots of fire whiskey like it's water, she mused in the seconds before her insides were set on fire. Her guts felt like they were wringing the Harry Potter right out of her, and she supposed it made sense if Polyjuice changed you inside and out. She wondered if the pain in her lower abdomen would lessen if she wasn't swapping primary sex characteristics, and then she had no attention for wonderings at all as the burning sensation moved to her muscles and skin. She felt her limbs lengthen slightly and her facial features shift, and then it was over. As she caught her breath, she supposed she should save her complaints for later on. If the ruse lasted through puberty, the differences would start to become really pronounced. They were lucky they looked somewhat similar to one another to begin with. Stinging eyes and blurred vision made Rigel stumble to the sink to take the contacts out. Staring back from the mirror was her cousin, Archie, with a few small differences from when she'd last seen him. He'd grown his hair out a little, and there was a lack of musculature in his arms that told her whatever he'd been up to at AIM, it wasn't Quidditch. Sirius was waiting in the cafe like he'd promised, and for Sirius, waiting meant casually flirting with one of the waitresses. It was unexpectedly warming to catch his devil-may-care grin lighting up the shadows that never seemed to leave his face, but she did feel a bit sorry for the waitress when Sirius's attention waned the instant he caught sight of his son. Archie! Sirius leapt off the stool and bounded over like the overgrown puppy he was. He scooped her up and swung her around him in a circle, not appearing to notice that his kid wasn't six years old any more. Several patrons narrowly avoided being broadsided by Rigel's trainers, and if she hadn't already changed from her dress robes, they would have collected a full dining set from the cafe tables. You're back! Sirius twisted her before him as though he was examining a giant plushie, and all in one piece, despite attempts made to the contrary, all this worrying is turning my hair grey. It's not even a little bit grey, she assured him. Sirius lifted her over his head like they were figure skaters, bringing her nose to his perfectly black locks. Look at the roots for me, will you? I'm worried about this section in the back I can't see properly. Dad! Rigel pushed her face away from the smell of his coconut hair product. Your hair is fine. Better looking than everyone else's put together, I swear. Sirius held her at arm's length, squinting suspiciously. She rolled her eyes. Honestly, you wonder why I asked you to meet me away from the platform. If his face hadn't been right in front of her, she wouldn't have seen it. Surprise and shame flitted through her uncle's grey irises, and Rigel felt instantly like a complete ass. No, I mean, I didn't mean it like that, Dad. She had spoken without thinking, teasing without realising that after months apart, Sirius and Archie's relationship was not as bulletproof as it always seemed. I'm only joking, 
she tried as Sirius set her down. It's cool, Arch. Sirius slung an arm around her shoulders carelessly and led them out of the cafe and onto busy sidewalks. I get it. When I was your age, I didn't want my parents within ten miles of my friends. No! Rigel pulled Sirius to a stop, determined to straighten things out before she damaged Archie and Sirius's relationship beyond repair. Hey, kiddo, it's no big deal, Sirius said, his voice betraying not a hint of the hurt she had seen under the surface just moments before. It is, if that's what you think, Rigel said. She gave Sirius Archie's most earnest expression. Dad, I love you. It's not anything like it was with your parents. I'm not ashamed of you or embarrassed by you in any way. I think you're the greatest, bestest, most charming, fun, magnificent, caring, cool... You forgot devilishly attractive. Hilariously amazing dad in the whole world, Rigel continued, pretending not to notice how Sirius preened under her praise. I really was joking just now. I didn't keep you from the station because I don't want to be seen with you. I talk about you all the time. The Weasley twins worship the ground you walk on, you know, and Draco and Pansy would have loved to meet you. Then why? Sirius didn't look hurt or bracingly cheerful any more. He looked confused. Because I was selfish, Rigel said, stalling for time with a self-deprecating grimace. She hated lying to Sirius. He was a close third to Remus and her mother on the list of people it was really hard to lie to. But without explaining about the polyjuice, she would have to stretch the truth to its snapping point. Everyone at school knows you, or thinks they do. You're famous for your joke line, your aura career, and yes, also your incredibly old and wealthy family. The truth is, I was meeting Pansy and Draco's parents at the station. I wanted to make a good impression, and I'm not saying I don't think you'd give a good impression, because you would, Dad, but I wanted to make a good impression on my own, you know? I wanted them to like or dislike me for me, not because my dad, the head of the House of Black, was there. Sirius was silent for a long moment. Draco and Pansy, huh? You know, I used to be on pretty good terms with Cousin Sissa. She says hi, Rigel confirmed, but I honestly wasn't sure how it would go down. The train platform is kind of neutral territory, but I didn't want to muck up my first meeting with them by putting you in a position that would go against the Great Split, or putting them in a position where they had to treat me like they'd treat you, and vice versa. She shook her head. I don't know. Politics is so complicated. That's a lot, Arch. Sirius put his hands on his hips and tapped his fingers against his denim-clad waist. OK. I can understand why you arranged it this way. I'm not sure any of that would have occurred to me if you'd asked. To be honest, I never took the split that seriously. Some of them are all right, you know. Yeah, I know. Rigel smiled Archie's easy smile at Sirius. And I know you wouldn't have done anything to make it uncomfortable, but you know how some of the stiffer purebloods can be. I just wanted everything to go smoothly. Still, I should have told you. Yes, you should have, Sirius said firmly. A bit of his familiar humour snuck back into his tone. You should always tell me everything. It's a very easy rule to remember. Did I hurt your feelings? She asked slyly. Sirius sucked in an affronted breath. Why, you little, hurt my feelings? Who's the grown-up here? He set off at a brisk stalk. Rigel laughed and caught up to him. That remains to be seen. Sirius tucked his hands into his jeans as they strolled. So, Draco and Pansy. Gonna be heavy hitters in dark society one day. Pansy's punching above her weight class already, Rigel said. The Parkinson's aren't a bad pair, though I dare say Cassius gets by on his wife's charm in most social interactions. Sirius waggled his eyebrows. Did he adjust his glasses at you? Rigel snorted. At least twice. With an apologetic frown, she added, I really should have included you. You know these people better than I ever will. Did Sissa say anything else? Sirius pretended not to care about the answer, the only sure sign that he did. Just hi. She said the sun has eclipsed the dog star, though I'm not sure what that means. 
She didn't... Oh, good try, but I doubt after more than a decade of marriage to Malfoy, Sissa has finally started making celestial puns. Sirius grinned. She misses me, huh? She's doing fine without you, as far as I can tell. Was she always that blonde? Because all the other blacks are... Well, black-haired, aren't we? Rigel asked. His grin became a smirk. Oh, yes, she gave my uncle Cygnus quite a shock when she came out Malfoy blonde, nearly called a formal duel with old Abraxas until he realised Sissa had his nose. Of course, the paternity potion helped. I believe when Lucius asked for her hand, Auntie Druella told him to have at it, on account of Sissa having clearly been meant for a Malfoy all along. They laughed, and Rigel thought she was finally getting a feel for Archie's role. She could do this for another few hours, if needed. Sirius found an alley he liked, and apparated them to the steps of Grimold Place. Rigel narrowly managed not to lose custody of the train snacks in her stomach as the universe squeezed her through the eye of a needle on her way across London. So, how's Marcus? Sirius asked, making no move to open the front door. You see him around much? Sometimes, she said casually, as if she didn't have a mountain of the older boy's homework in her trunk at that very moment. He's captain of the Quidditch team, so I see him at Draco's practices, but the upper years don't mix much with the younger students. Especially in Slytherin, right? Sirius nodded in understanding. I remember when Regulus got invited to sit with the Lestrange brothers as a third year, thought his head might explode from the pressure. Rigel said nothing. Knowing Regulus was an uncomfortable subject for Sirius. She'd only seen Sirius's brother once at Diana's funeral, but she knew he'd joined the SOW party while still in school. The split had cut more than a few families in half, but she gathered the Black brothers had never been close. I'm glad to hear Marcus is well, though, Sirius said as he fished keys out of his pocket. Rigel's eyes narrowed on them. Sirius didn't usually lock his front door. They had wards for that. He doesn't go home for breaks, does he? Trying to juggle her mounting suspicion with the conversation, Rigel vaguely recalled Flint signing the roster to stay over the holidays. No, I don't think so. Good. Sirius slid the key in the lock, and Rigel braced herself for four months of pranks rolled into a single moment. There would be slime. There might be glitter. Sirius flung the door open and lifted his arms like a bullfighter. Ta-da! Why are you ducking? Rigel stood from her protective crouch warily. It might be a trick. She peered into the entryway of Grimold Place and blinked, glanced at Sirius in confusion. Were you robbed? Rob? No, it's redecorated. It had clearly been ransacked not to mention vandalised, and all the more alarming that Sirius didn't see it. Everything from the hat rack to the umbrella stand had been dipped in green paint. The main corridor, where the heads of house elves passed once hung, appeared to be the victim of a tinsel typhoon. Silvery strands hung like Spanish moss from the torch brackets, the chandeliers, the banisters and the door frames. Clumps of it littered the floor like a patchy Easter basket, gathering in unlikely corners and probably nesting with a new generation of dust bunnies. Rigel finally saw the banner, snakes dancing in a continuous loop, welcoming her to what she could only assume was some sort of Slytherin-inspired funhouse her uncle had forgotten to take down after Halloween. Welcome home, it proclaimed. She cleared her throat. I thought Remus was kidding. I thought you were kidding. Sirius gave her a look that said she clearly should have known him better. I never kid about defacing my family's seat. He chortled with delight as he towed off his boots and hung his coat on the snakehead pegs by the door. Your sorting opened up a world of decorating possibilities, so we went to town. We? Rigel sincerely doubted Remus had contributed creatively to the stylistic choices on display. Do you like it? Feel right at home? Rigel stared and stared at it. I don't know what to say. Yes, I can see you're overwhelmed. Sirius took her elbow in his. Let me give you the full tour. He showed her the parlour, with its green brocade couches and tapestries so silver they were practically mirrors. 
They saw the kitchen with its new silver dishes. Not real silver, Sirius hastily assured her, in deference to Remus's slight allergy, and the little snake salt and pepper shakers that hissed when you turned them upside down. The library wallpaper has been redone in electric green and metallic silver stripes, and Rigel pointedly did not ask whether the new snakeskin upholstery on the reading settee was real. Archie's bedroom saw a reassertion of taste, done over in deep, soothing emerald, with subtle platinum highlights in the doorknobs and window fastenings. The stuffed snake on the pillow was almost cute, and Rigel thought Remus must have taken over on Archie's spaces until she ducked into the ensuite bathroom to sneak a sip of polyjuice and saw the green, glow-in-the-dark toilet paper stacked like a Christmas tree. Only the garden redeemed it. Remus hadn't been kidding in his first letter. The enclosed courtyard which used to house Diana's vegetable garden was now home to 12 English grass snakes, which had been magicked an unnaturally bright green. The enclosure had the unlikely dimensions of the magically enlarged, and Sirius had rigged a chain of complicated weather charms to keep it temperature controlled. The little Wrigleys get all the sunshine they need, Sirius said proudly. As he opened the pane door, six of the sunbathing snakes came slithering over to greet them. Sirius bent down to pet their heads and croon words of praise, and Rigel reassessed his dedication to the decoration scheme. He actually looked quite fond of them. At her incredulous smile, he pouted. What? They're highly domesticated. She observed their indolent sprawling, languid slinking, and tired tongue flicks. They look a bit lethargic. I think you're overfeeding them. I feed them until they won't eat anymore, just like I did with you. You should write a parenting book. The serious method, Sirius nodded. I would look pretty good on the inside of a jacket cover. He would probably make thousands of galleons, even if there was nothing between the pages but pictures of his own snakes. Sirius could simply do stuff like that. The littlest snake began twining up Sirius's bare foot, and to Rigel's surprise, it said, Take me inside with you this is time. One whose smell is like dogs's. I want to see where you keep the snacks. <laughs> oh, that tickles, Sirius laughed, hopping on one foot as he pulled the little snake gently off his other. This one always climbs on me, trying to get inside the house. Rigel had to wonder how much free time Sirius actually had if he was spelling snakes to talk to him. It was good Archie would be home for the break, but perhaps they could convince Remus to look in on the ex-aura more often. Sirius quit his career in law enforcement when Diana fell ill, and even after her passing, he never went back. He volunteered in the children's ward at St Mungo's a few times a week and seemed to have no trouble living off his family's fortune. She suspected the interest alone was enough to sustain all but his most lavish indulgences. When will Harry be home? she asked as they meandered back into the kitchen. Lily and James are picking her up as we speak, I think. Sirius rooted in the pantry and came up with a loaf of bread and a jar of peanut butter. The whole gang will be here for dinner. I bet Harry's over earlier, though. You know how she is, always checking up on you. Yeah. Rigel said around the dramatic irony in her throat. Harry sure does worry about me. She's more Lily than James, Sirius said idly. He stuck a table knife into the peanut butter and pushed it her way. Lunch? Rigel coated two slices of bread and stuck them together, the simple act feeling odd after months of eating elf-made food. Was it hard getting used to life without house elves? Sirius stared at her. Mouthful of peanut butter, he gummed. What do you mean? I just mean after Hogwarts. She realised how it sounded and quickly amended. Oh, I don't think we should get one. It just feels strange to make my own food now, and it's only been a few months. I can't imagine after seven years. Sirius swallowed and shrugged. I got used to fending for myself when I moved out of this house. I was glad to, though I should admit I ate a lot of meals at James's place. His mum taught me how to cook, actually. Sirius laughed. That's why he comes over so often. I learned her recipes better than Lily did. Rigel tried not to look too pointedly at the peanut butter sandwich in her uncle's hands. 
but he was fooling himself if he thought Grandma Potter's recipes were why her parents insisted on having dinner with him several nights a week. She'd never met any of her grandparents. The elder Potters both died of dragonpox just before she was born, and she was pretty sure Lily's parents had passed away while her mother was still in school. The Blacks had been numerous enough to form their own political faction at one point, but now there was only Sirius and Regulus, unless one counted the witches who'd married out. Archie had grandparents on his mother's side, but they weren't close. She didn't know why. It was a bit sad when she thought about it that families as big as the Blacks and Potters had once been could now have dinner together without even putting the extra leaf in the dining room table. Do you ever wish you had more kids? she asked. Sirius choked on his sandwich. When he'd found his heir again, he gave her a bewildered frown. Arch, where's this coming from? You know I'd never remarry. I know. She ducked her head. I just wondered if you wished you'd had more. Before. She shouldn't have brought it up. It was none of her business, but she felt terrible when she imagined Sirius in this big house all alone. She should have written more often. Next term, she wouldn't get so wrapped up in things that she forgot about Sirius, waiting here with his jamless Sahara Desert sandwiches for Archie to write. Sirius shook his head slowly. One was more than I had reason to hope for. My parents were cousins, with the requisite history of close marriages on both sides. Regulus himself was a Merlin-ordained miracle. I didn't know if I'd even be fertile enough to sire a kid that lived, but Diana didn't care. She loved me enough to try, and you were so perfect. You cried like a little lion. You were everything we needed, and we didn't have the heart to roll the dice a second time. He meant the fade. That nebulous, not quite a disease, not quite a curse draining, that caused some magical infants to simply fade away before their parents' eyes. Everyone said it affected second- and third-born children disproportionately. It was the reason most of her classmates had no siblings. Sirius reached over to ruffle her hair. You worried about your old man here all alone? She was, and Archie would be too. You went and got twelve new mouths to feed while I was gone. Seems a fair question. Just keeping you on your toes, succession-wise and all? Sirius grinned. The little one's feisty. She might murder the rest of you for a shot at the title. I'm not worried, she smirked. If there's one thing I'm learning in Slytherin, it's how to protect myself from snakes. Sirius wrinkled his nose. Don't do that with your mouth. You look like a Malfoy. You smirk, she pointed out. Sirius put a hand to his heart. My smirk is devilish and attractive. Lucius Malfoy's smirk is self-satisfied and smarmy. Frankly, I'm shocked and unsettled that you can't see the difference. I can. She meant it to be funny, but the joke fell heavily between them because it was true. There was a huge difference between Lucius Malfoy and Sirius Black, and she didn't want him to think Archie had forgotten what it was. You're nothing like them, Dad. Sirius smiled. Thanks, Arch. That was something else she'd have to address. You know, I've been going by my middle name at school. Rigel? I didn't know you even liked your middle name, Sirius said, looking puzzled. I only picked it because it wasn't on Regulus's list of suggestions. Well, I'm growing up now. She immediately felt about eight for saying that out loud. Gamely, she pressed on. Archie sounds a bit young, but Arcturus is a mouthful at my age. I'll switch back when I'm older, I think. And of course you can still call me Archie at home. I just wanted you to know in case someone from school mentions me as Rigel. Ah, Sirius waved the peanut butter knife dismissively. Not like I can talk about nicknames. I was the genius who came up with Mooney. School is a time for growing, so if you want to grow as Rigel, I say go for it. Thanks. Rigel cleared the bread and peanut butter, setting them on a random shelf inside the pantry. So how many pranks do you think we can set up before Uncle James gets here? Sirius's face split into a mischievous grin she hoped the Weasley twins never caught sight of. He'll be expecting about four, so I think we should aim for twelve. You just like the number twelve, Rigel said. It's a dignified number. 
which is why it doesn't suit you at all. You'd better hope I don't set up thirteen, because the last one will be on you, little snake. If I thought an old dog like you had any new tricks, I might actually be scared. She raised her brows loftily. You forget I've been marinating among the next generation of pranksters. The Weasley twins have taught me things you and Uncle James never dreamed of. Prove it! You asked for it. Well, you'll be begging for it. For what? Mercy! Ah, no, Dad, where are you tickling? Admit I'm a spry young pup. I admit nothing, you mangy old stry. The front door opened. Remus caught them frozen on the stairs, Rigel hanging onto the banister with all her strength as Sirius attempted to drag her through the tinsel by her leg. Remus raised his bag of pranking supplies with a smile. Thought you might need these. Minus zero. Peep, peep, peep. Minus zero. Archie, Lily and James arrived a few hours later, and damned if they didn't get exactly twelve pranks set up in the nick of time. Some of them were disabled right away, like the bucket of shed snakeskin over the doorway. Rigel did not ask Sirius how long he'd been collecting it. Others would probably never be triggered, like the eyes of the non-moving painting of Salazar Slytherin now hanging in the dining room, which would set fire to the hair of anyone who stared at them longer than thirty seconds. One Rigel insisted on purely to disorient Remus's sharp nose. Dung bombs were truly a tool for all occasions, and if she accidentally dropped one on him while suspending a batch in a net over the toilet, well, she must be a bit rusty, that's all. James had a good time trying and sometimes failing to ferret them out before they went off, and even waiting for James to go first didn't save Lily from all of them. Remus was tricky with his time-delayed spells that way. In the chaos, Rigel and Archie snuck upstairs to her cousin's bedroom unquestioned. Archie closed the door with a sigh of relief. That was close. He pulled the usual chest of drawers over in front of the door and collapsed on the bed. My juice is about to wear off, and I didn't fancy another hour as you, no offence. None taken, Rigel said, sitting on the foot of the bed. I've got another ten minutes, I think. It's good to see you. Me? I've been worried sick about you. Archie lifted his head from the pillow to scowl at her. I had to count all your limbs after polyjuicing into you, just to make sure you hadn't been maimed. What's to worry about? Rigel asked. She hadn't written anything overly alarming in her letters. Uncle James said that Dad said that you'd been attacked by another student. Archie pinned her with a hard look. So why didn't you write me about that? I mentioned I had an altercation with Lee Jordan, but not that he'd been expelled for assaulting you. He wasn't, technically, she winced. My dad knows about that. He must have heard about it at work. And he has a lot of questions for you. Me? Ugh! Archie blew out a frustrated breath. Harry, you have to tell me these things. If you downplay the important events, how am I supposed to know when we're in crisis mode? We're not in... Archie raised his voice to cover hers. Because right now it feels like even if you were dying, you wouldn't tell me. She clamped her mouth shut and stared at him. Was that really how she'd made him feel? I wasn't trying to hide it from you, she said. The Jordan thing was weird. I didn't know what was going on until he attacked me, and then it was just over. He left the school, so there wasn't anything anyone could do at that point. And what happened on Halloween? That's complicated. Archie looked at his watch. You have forty minutes until din- Ow! He doubled over, skin rippling, muscles and Merlin knew what else, sliding grotesquely underneath. She had to resist the urge to scoot backwards on the bed. Polyjuice transformations were as disturbing to watch as they were painful to experience. When it was over, Archie panted on the emerald bedding. Well, that's rubbish, he said. Where was I? We have forty minutes until dinner. Yes, and you're going to tell me every single thing that happened while you were pretending to be me. Yes, Mum. I... Hmm, we seem to be experiencing a role reversal. 
Archie frowned. Aren't you supposed to lecture me? Must be this polyjuice. It's making me confused. Can't you jog in place or something to work it through your system faster? I'm not sure it's a function of metabolism, she said, thinking. But what if it was? Her fingers itched for a notebook so she could write the question down for future experiments. Did polyjuice wear off faster if the subject exercised vigorously while under its influence? Or could some individuals metabolise it at a different rate for any reason? But then the advertised period of effectiveness would be way off for those people. She lost the thread of inquiry as her insides squirmed and her skin began to burn. Archie made a face and turned away until the transformation passed. She fingered her unruly curls and reached for the glasses Archie had torn off in disgust the moment he entered the room. They perched smartly on her nose, and the world felt at once a step removed, safely filtered before it reached her, nothing like the uncomfortable immersion that was being Archie. I never knew how much I liked being me, she said reverently. They turned their backs on each other and switched clothes. Archie had worn her favourite blue sweater and a pair of jeans, and Rigel felt like a bird resettling into her nest as hugged herself. Her cousin stretched his limbs. It's good to be Archie again. I guess that makes me Harry again. She smiled. Yes, Harry. Perfect. OK, Harry, then start going over the last four months with me. Archie ran his hands through his hair, seemingly just because he could. And I don't mean the lies we're going to tell our parents. I mean what really happened. Harry started at the beginning, knowing that unless Archie knew everything that transpired when she was him and vice versa, they might get their stories mixed up one day. When she was finished, Archie blinked several times, then said, The way you talk about your magic is both awesome and terrifying. Awesome implies a bit of terror, Harry said, but what do you mean? It sounds as though your magic can make things happen without you even learning how. If my magic could do that, think how many people I could help as a healer. Harry frowned. It's not a good thing. It's dangerous. Only to people who try to hurt you, Archie argued. I'm glad it took care of Jordan. It frightens me. Why? Archie searched her features, but Harry didn't have a good answer to give him. It wasn't a feeling she could rationalise. She couldn't point to that time she got stung by a bee and say, There, that's why she hated bees. This felt more instinctual, like a fear of heights. A person didn't have to fall off a cliff to be nervous about the edge. Do you think it would turn on you? What's to stop it? She asked herself that question all the time. What if I got so embarrassed one day, I wished I could disappear, and then I did? What if I was mad at you, and my magic lashed out even though I didn't mean it to? My magic shouldn't just give me whatever I want. I think I think that's how wizards go bad. They take whatever they want by the strength of their magic, even when it conflicts with what other people want. Archie made a face. But it's you! Exactly. Exactly, exactly, Archie said. Harry, you're the most collected, level-headed, fair... Don't forget honest, she put in wryly. Just kind-hearted? No, don't snort at me. Hard-working, deserving person I've ever met. And if you reach the point that your magic lashes out at someone, you can bet they deserve it. Look at Jordan. Before that, it never hurt anyone. I only had a working wand for a month before it reached that level of... Archie put a hand over her mouth to quiet her, his grey eyes perfectly serious. Even when we were kids, and you used to freak out when you did accidental magic, I never saw what the big deal was. You're scared it might hurt someone, but it never did. Your magic wouldn't do something abhorrent to you because it's a part of you. You can't know that, she mumbled beneath his hand. It was all too easy to say something bad never happened until it did. But I do believe it. Archie wiped his hand on the bed. You're a good person, Harry. Your magic is going to do good things. Harry thought of Snape's chair bursting into a shower of needles, the ropes unravelling, straw dummies exploding, and she didn't think it would really be that simple. <laughs>
Maybe her magic was benign now, but the only thing keeping the people close to her safe from it was her own emotions, which could swing wildly the moment her desires diverged from rational constraints. Whatever Archie thought, her magic was dangerous. Like all dangerous things, it ought to be monitored, controlled. But how could she monitor her own emotions? Archie told her all about AIM, how his basic healing classes were going, and his friend Hermione, of whom she was expected to speak fondly. She learned the names of his teachers, some key classmates in the healing track, and in turn, she gave him easy-to-remember characteristics for Pansy and Draco, Fred and George, Ron and Neville, and, of course, Professor Snape, though she wasn't sure if they'd be telling the family about her extra potions work just yet. When they thought they were ready to face the adults, they headed downstairs. There you two are! Lily looked up from the onion she was chopping, finished exchanging secret confidences. Harry and Archie did not so much as exchange a guilty look. Just proving to Archie I'm still the best at exploding snap. Hi, Mum! Harry ducked under Lily's elbow for a sidelong hug. Previously, she wouldn't have said her mother had a smell, but breathing it in, under the residual lingering dung-bomb smell in the air, she realised she'd missed it. Lily gave her a strange look, but juggled the knife awkwardly to hug her back. Hello, darling. My, my, two hugs in one day. You must have missed me more than you let on, she teased. Harry smiled sheepishly, but internally she winced. Emotional weakness. One. Ruse. Zero. It would be foolish to relax now just because she was herself again. This was the most crucial stage where their two lives overlapped with the people who knew them best and where they had to explain away any discrepancies. Harry had to keep her wits. Archie, come here. I barely got to see you before you ran off upstairs. Lily embraced Archie warmly. Over the top of Archie's head, Lily added... Harry, aren't you going to give your uncle a proper hello? Harry felt extremely foolish crossing the kitchen and hugging Sirius as though it was the first time she'd seen him that day. It also felt wrong not to hug her father, who looked at once exactly the same and much older than he had four months ago, but she resisted the urge. She'd work one in later, more subtly. She could tell Archie was itching to pounce on his dad too, but instead he shot her a commiserating smile. As usual, Lily and Sirius cooked dinner. They, who so seldom agreed on anything, were like well-oiled clockwork in the kitchen. When Lily chopped, Sirius stirred. When Sirius put something in the oven, Lily set the timer. Even more amazing than the way they worked together was the way the food tasted when they worked together. It was like adding Lily's cooking to Sirius's cooking and multiplying by a factor of ten. Dinner conversation should have been easy. They should have been able to fall back into old patterns and jokes as if they'd never been away. And it was. And they could. And yet... So, how do you like Hogwarts? A swift kick from Archie under the table kept Harry from answering automatically. It's great, Archie said enthusiastically. The castle is grand, and I've made loads of friends, and the classes aren't as old-fashioned as I thought. Who've you pranked so far? James asked. He eyed Archie over the top of his glasses like a manager waiting for an expense report. Well, um, you haven't pranked anyone yet. Sirius looked embarrassedly over at James and Remus, who both made the sign of the trickster with solemn faces. Lily rolled her eyes. Archie's too smart to rush into unfamiliar territory with a handful of firecrackers, Harry said. Yeah, I've been playing it carefully. A sly smile grew on Archie's face. In fact, I was so careful no one else realises this, but I started a prank war between Slytherin and Gryffindor. Biggest one the school's seen in years. Now I've got a pretty good idea of what the top players are capable of. Soon I can start on my own stuff. <laughs> Getting a handle on the competition first, James said slowly. He nodded. Clever. And without identifying yourself as a threat? Remus added. They'll underestimate you. Oh, ho, oh, I knew you were holding back this afternoon. Sirius reached over to clap Archie on the back. 
Was it Harry's strategy? I know a long game when I see one. How did we end up with such smart kids' prongs? You had good taste in women, Remus said dryly. It's true. James gave Lily a sappy smile. Merlin knows all of Harry's brains come from her mother. She'll need them, Lily said, especially in those healing classes. It's a difficult route. You've gone for healing? Remus paused with his fork halfway to his mouth. Not potions. Archie and I have it all worked out, Harry said, faux casual. We're going to try and fulfil each other's dreams. She ignored the way Remus slowly set his fork down and gave her his full attention. In that vein, healing classes are going great. Soon I'll be able to mend broken bones, I think. I'm going to teach Archie a bit of the theory over winter break. Sirius rolled back one of his sleeves. What luck! I have a bruise from setting up the pie launcher earlier. What pie launcher is that? Lily asked sweetly. Not the one at your house, Lils, the other... Uh, I mean, quick, Harry, heal me up before your mum murders me. Sirius Orion Black. Is that where the pies we brought over yesterday went? James looked a little heartbroken at the thought of dessert sacrificed for the greater goof. Sirius pulled Harry's chair back from the table and cowered behind her as though she was a human shield. You'll fix my bones when Lily breaks them, won't you, my favourite niece? Sorry, my second favourite uncle. I'm not allowed to do magic outside of school, Harry said. Not to mention she had no idea how to heal bruises, much less a broken bone. She'd started reading up on the theory, but the Hogwarts library didn't have a ton of healing-related tomes. Oh, come on, Sirius cajoled. He bent close as though imparting a grave secret. The house is warded. I just know you're not encouraging my child to break the decree for the restriction of underage sorcery, Lily said. The sugar coating on her voice could have choked a candy cane. It's actually called the Decree for the Reasonable Restriction of Underage Sorcery, Sirius said loftily. I don't care what it's called. Our children are not getting expelled because you bumped your knee setting up pranks in your own house. It was my elbow, Lillian. It'll be your skull, Sirius Black. The smart witches always go for your brains. Sirius told Archie conspiratorially. They get smarter whenever you get dumber, he eyed James meaningfully. Remember that. Lily picked up the salt shaker threateningly, and it grew to the size of a swan. Harry thought her mother had done it until the hissing shaker came to life and began to thrash its way through the stuffed peppers. Sirius roared with laughter as the tail of the giant tableware whacked the mixed salad into James's lap. Just another quiet dinner at grim old place, Remus mused, as he saved his pumpkin juice from certain annihilation. And since I have a feeling I know where the pies that were supposed to be for dessert went, can Archie and I be excused? Harry asked. James looked torn between wanting pie and wanting to see pie launched, but Remus excused them with a cheerful wink, and they retreated to Archie's room. So? Yeah. We haven't got it good enough, Archie said. It's because we're both trying to be two different people simultaneously. Harry frowned. What if instead of me trying to be you, and you trying to be me, and then getting confused on who's who, we both try to be the same person? You lost me. We homogenize our alternate selves, Harry explained. It was a perfect idea, and she didn't know why Archie was looking at her as if she'd suggested they both get brain transplants. I learn healing, you learn potions. We both prank the same amount, and so, so we're the same. So we're interchangeable, Archie said. He grinned, starting to appreciate her genius. We can't be caught out when someone asks me to make a potion, or you to cure a cold if we can do those things. It'll mean a lot of extra studying for both of us, Harry said. But this had to happen anyway for us to be able to switch back eventually, right? Right. And if our parents know we're teaching one another, it won't even be that weird when you get a potions mastery and I test for a healing certification, right? Right. 
Even if someone suspects we switched, they won't be able to prove it. Unless they find out Harry was a boy when she attended AIM, Archie said. Harry wasn't worried about that. It's not illegal to hide your sex. If anyone asks, I pretended to be a boy all those years. What are they going to do about it? But that means no one can ever know for sure that you're a boy, Archie. I'll be the shyest boy at AIM, Archie agreed. He frowned. Wait, does this mean no, you know, until I'm 17? She shook her head, grossed out, but also amused. No, it just means you just can't have sex while pretending to be me. Do whatever you want over the summer. I don't want to, Archie said quickly. I was just asking. It's best to get these things sorted now. Sure, but I think the bigger problem is our appearances, Harry admitted. I've been researching polyjuice to try and find a way to make it last longer. I think we need to consider a permanent alteration if we're going to survive, say, any random person who happens to meet both of us at any point over the next seven years. Archie groaned. I don't want to be you all the time. I want to switch back over the summers and breaks. I'll do my best. But she wouldn't make any promises. They were swiftly approaching a point of no return. OK, I trust you. Harry nodded gratefully. Back to our schooling, we should create a combined syllabus for all the Hogwarts and AIM classes we're taking. Some of it will overlap, but we have to fill in any of the gaps that don't. It's going to be like attending two schools at once. Archie rubbed his forehead. Who knew chasing your dreams was so hard? You can back out now if you want, Harry offered. It pained her to put the choice on the table, but she'd never force Archie to do anything he didn't want to do. I'll cook up some spatagroit for us to catch. We'll be out of school for a few months. And when we go back, it won't be surprising that we look slightly different. Just say the word. Archie took a deep breath and let it slowly out. Never. We're in this together, Harry, and I am going to be the second best potions brewer in our generation by the time we're through. Then I'll be the second best healer. You'd better be, Archie sniffed. If you pick up healing faster than I do, I shall be very put out. You won't be worried when you see my wand work. I haven't even seen your new wand yet. Where is it? Archie asked expectantly. Harry paused to think about it. Um, I think it's in my, I mean, your trunk, maybe. No wonder it's mad at you. Archie shook his head. You've practically abandoned the poor thing. Have not? All the same, she crossed to the unshrunk trunk and dug around in it until she found her wand rolled up in a pair of old socks. She half expected the wand to shock her for the indignity when she pulled it free, but it thrummed happily, purring like a cat beneath her hand. It was more forgiving than she'd thought, or it was saving its energy to catch her unaware. Ready to face the grown-ups again? Archie asked. It'll get easier, Harry muttered. It had to. Bring the school bag in your trunk to Potter Place tomorrow morning. I'll bring whatever assignments you left in mine. We'll make a study plan. Deal. Archie squeezed her in a sudden hug. Don't worry. We'll get through this firestorm. And find stars on the other side, right, Archie? It was something Diana used to say. And find worlds on the other side, Harry. We hope you enjoyed this chapter. Please consider supporting our project by joining our Patreon linked in the description. Or become a member here on YouTube, where you will get access to several additional chapters weeks before they release on YouTube.